Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. Yes! 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 Oh, 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 oh! I've been watching a lot of playoff hockey over the years. Okay, we all have, and it hasn't been like this with the Philadelphia Flyers. So, you know, I see the back and forth action. I see overtime goals. I see big momentum swings throughout all these different series. But I never experience it with the Flyers because it's been so damn long. And here we go, back and forth. They're up three goals. A magnificent first period, a dominant first period. You can argue that was the best first period that they had not even first period stop bro stop saying first period it was the best period that they had as a whole since the playoff started Kevin Hayes electric going short side not once but twice and Claude Giroux having a big impact on that first goal and when you look at the stat sheet afterwards you're only going to see Claude Giroux's name on there one time but I'll tell you what Claude Giroux had an insane game Claude Giroux was awesome so for all the Claude Giroux haters out there If you didn't see how good he was in this performance, then you don't know the little things when it comes to the game. This is one of those games where the stat sheet doesn't do it do do his game a lot of service. He was incredible, winning battles, all the little things. That goal, the first goal for the Flyers to take the lead. And if you remember, the Islanders had some spark to start off. So the Flyers were on their heels a bit. He wins a defensive zone draw, they exit the zone, and Kevin Hayes goes down the ice and rips one over Varlamov's shoulder on the short side to give the Flyers a one to nothing lead. Awesome, tremendous. Then he does it again. Here's Joel Farabee. Like the Flyers were flipping the puck into the neutral zone, which I thought was a really great strategy. It was able to get the Flyers out of their defensive zone and put some pressure on the Islanders' defense as well because as they were waiting for the puck, you had some speed going through the neutral zone. Farabee wins a battle along the boards. Kevin Hayes picks it up. This one was a bit of a weaker goal. The first one was a legit snip. The second one, probably a weak goal that Varlamov would like to have back, but the the Flyers were up 2 nothing, and I'm telling you, the, the way that first period started, you haven't seen the Flyers click like that since the round robin play. You haven't seen the Flyers play that good in the playoffs at all in round robin play, sure, but not since that first round really started. So it, it looked like the real Flyers team that we saw before the stoppage. Oh, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna freak out just thinking about this game. By the way, this episode of Sports Talk with Broads is sponsored by Orbit Energy and Power. With over 20 years of experience in the industry, they are home to your solar experts. Their solar program helps eliminate your electric bill completely. They offer flexible financing solutions such as $0 down. Make sure you check out their information. It's in the description. So the Flyers actually took a 3-0 lead. Another play where the Flyers get it out of their zone. Claude Giroux with a, with a nasty little tip pass to Cootsie. And Cootsie had a horrendous game one. He's dancing around Letty and just scoring beautiful biscuits. He undressed them the way he went through his body, beat him on the other side, and put it in. It was awesome. Coots! Coots! So oh, I missed that chance so much. Claude Giroux, though. And going back to that first goal, just because I want to praise Claude a little bit more. Not only did he have a great defensive zone draw win, but the way that he went up the ice and he drove the net, it went from D zone draw win to being the first one driving hard to the net. The little things. The little things that don't add up on the score sheet. Tremendous game out of the captain. And it was big that that line was able to generate a lot. Couturier, Voracek, Claude Giroux, very important. I thought that they were noticeable players in this one. More Kuti and G than Voracek, but I I thought that those guys really stood out, and and when you have a really piss-poor performance, 
to be quite frank, in game one. You need the top guys to answer the bell. We've been screaming about the top guys needing to score for how long? Since the Canadian series. Great first period. The lineup changed, by the way. AV made some adjustments. Scott Lawton out, JVR in up front. And it's funny that that happened because pregame, I was on 97.3 ESPN from 2 to 3 o'clock. And we had on our Flyers insider, Kevin Durso, who does an awesome job covering this team. And I was asking him the question, and I, I literally said, I don't know if I'm being harsh or not, too harsh, but is Scott Lawton almost unplayable? He's turning pucks in the middle of the ice, in the D zone. He's doing big circles when it comes to being up at the point instead of blocking shots and stopping and starting. And, you know, the answer was somewhere along the lines of, look, he's not playing great right now. You needed him to step up. He was a great player with Hayes and TK as a line when they were really clicking. That was a top line. He needs to produce more. As I asked that question, bang, the news dropped that JVR was in and Lawton was out. It's almost like maybe I wasn't being too harsh. I mean, Elaine Vien are on the same page. But I noticed it. He was awful in the last few games. Unplayable. Great move by AV. You got to do it. And I think this team needs JVR because this team needs scoring. Ghost was out. Haig was in. Haig finished with a plus two rating. I think the ghost experiment is out. Whether it was his fault or not that they lost game one, which I don't think it was. He didn't have the best game in the world. At this point, it's pretty clear that Haig is the better option. And I think that him and his D pair, they work together better than when Ghost is in his place. So please, let's continue to just rock and roll with Robert Haig. Something I, by the way, something I haven't thought about saying ever in my life watching him play over the years, but he really has grown into something pretty useful when it comes to the 6D that dresses every single night. All right, so the second period was definitely irritating. I'm okay with playing with the lead because that's what good teams do. You saw the Islanders do that with the Flyers in Game 1 where the Flyers came out in the second period, they pumped the Islanders, but good teams keep you to the outside, they limit your scoring chances, and they play a good sound game defensively. So I'm not one of those people freaking out, oh, you have to keep the pressure on, you need to do this, you need to keep shooting the puck on net and and, and getting all of these zone entries and 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 just being super offensive when you have a 3 nothing lead. I'm okay and I'm willing to play a defensive game where, okay, you might have some pressure from the Islanders, but as long as you do it the right way, you stay sound defensively, you stay true to the system, I will be okay with that. Good teams, great teams, they do that in the postseason. So I can acknowledge that that is what great teams do in playoff hockey. I just thought that they weren't able to execute the game plan defensively enough, and that's where they ran into some troubles. Like when Jake Voracek ends up throwing the puck over the boards in the D zone, and it's a delay of game, and here comes Barzell, who's gross, may I add. This kid is so filthy every time he has the puck. You know when you watch Nathan McKinnon, and he's moving his feet, he's stick-handling, and you're just mesmerized? Barzell has a similar game when he's in the offensive zone, he's creating offense, he's going around the net. You're so mesmerized. You're, you're stuck watching him. But those like that play by Voracek, that's the problem. That's where you can't make that mistake. And that allowed the Islanders to have a bit of life. And to that point, Carter Hart was sensational. Carter Hart had so many unbelievable saves that are just going to go unnoticed and just look like a normal save. And I feel like I'm a tape recorder when I say that because it's every game he's in the pipes. He's making these absurd saves that aren't standard. They're not your typical saves. But because Carter Hart does it all the time, to him, it's natural. But it's mind-blowing. Here comes pucks that are high, it bounces off the glass, it almost goes in, it goes in the blue paint, his pad's there. Or here's a wraparound and he finds a way to get his pad to the post and he stops it from going in. There were some legit chances from the Islanders throughout the first period and he was able to shut the door. Same in the second period, he was able to really deliver. Carter Hart was truly, once again, a sensational piece in between the pipes that it it, it blows my mind. 
It blows my mind. It really does. And there's some back-to-backs involved in this series, and you wonder what you're going to do now that the series is tied one-to-one. So, second period. The Barzell to Anders Lee goal got the Islanders on the board and made the score 3-1. to one. Here was a momentum switch. Niskanen hits Johnston. Pretty good. And if you look at the replay and you slow it down, was there some chin involved in the hit as well with the chest? It looked like Matt Niskanen's shoulder hit a bit of chest, hit a bit of chin, and it shook him up a bit. But that was a momentum changer for the Islanders. I felt like which is crazy, right? Normally, a big-time hit would generate energy for the squad that laid the hit. Hey, let's go, boys! Hey, that's the way to do it, Niski! You know, something like that. It would spark the club to go out there and play with that burst. But it almost did the opposite. It was almost as if that hit woke up the Islanders and pissed them off and made them so frustrated that they took the next step in their game. They responded with the hit on Myers. Nelson did. And... You you felt some change involved after that hit. Something happened in that second period that was minor, but it stood out to me. There was a one-on-two. It was almost even a one-on-three with Joel Farabee with the puck going in the offensive zone, and he tries to dangle. He tried to dangle. There was about two minutes left or so in the period. The Islanders had all the momentum. It's a 3-1 hockey game. You you can't be doing that. That's something that bothers me. He's young. He'll learn. I get it. But you can't try and dangle there. Maybe put it in the corner or maybe instead of dumping it in the corner, you take it, you skate it behind the net, you buy time, you curl, you allow your line mates or you allow whoever's on the ice to get up the ice with you. You buy time, use your body, but instead you try and dangle and that allows the Islanders to get the puck, move up ice, and then enter the zone and go into the Flyers' side of that. It's like, let's play smart hockey here. The Flyers are up 3-1 to one at the time. It's obvious the push is coming from New York. We need to play simple and make sure that the Islanders don't score another goal in that period. Escape that period 3-1, reassess, make some adjustments, head out in the third. Now, sadly, Kutsi gets a slash on a back check after that play happens, and now you're in the box to end the period. These are the mistakes I'm talking about. So I understand playing a defensive style game. I'm okay with it. I support it, to be honest with you, because the Flyers are so great at it. But when you start taking penalties and you give life to the Islanders, you allow them to work the puck around with a man advantage, well, that's not a recipe for success. That's where I have the issue. Luckily, though, the Flyers were able to kill that one off. That bled into the third period a bit, too, if I remember correctly. It was at the very end of the second period. The Flyers had power play chances. And, of course, no shock, by the way. No shock at all. They couldn't score. They had a chance. They had a couple chances. Put the game away. Put the game away. Don't even allow it to be just a three-goal game. Make it four. Make it five. You got the power play. Keep scoring. But this power play is dreadful. I mean, I've been screaming about it for how long now? It's going to be an issue. And it almost costed the Flyers in this game. Because if you score on those, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about going to overtime. In a situation where there's a back-to-back tomorrow. No need. No need at all. Before we touch on the third period, Support for Sports Talk with Broads is brought to you by Manscaped, who is best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. They obsess over their technology development to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. The Lawnmower 3.0 is the greatest thing that I have ever, ever utilized downstairs. That's right. And when I say downstairs, I'm not talking about the basement. I'm talking about below the belt. No cuts ever. The ceramic blade and the advanced skin-safe technology is outstanding. There's LED lights so you don't miss any spots. You can utilize it in the shower. Quiet Stroke technology with a 7,000 RPM motor. If you are listening to me right now, you need to experience this yourself. You will get, I will help you out, 
20% off and free shipping with the code BROD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code BROD. Your trunk, your junk will thank you. Shrimp, those balls of yours. Third period action. Once again, all Islanders. A little upsetting. Bovillier comes down. Rips it past Carter Hart short side. It must be the short side day. Because Varlamov, oh, oh, how, how could I forget? Varlamov was pulled after the third. So you had a backup goalie in Grice in the net. I thought, hey, you know, with that being in play, you had an opportunity at times to pepper some shots on it. Specifically, Joel Farabee. I talked about maybe buying time. Well, if Joel Farabee at the end of the second realizes, okay, here's Grice, a backup goalie. Why don't I wind one up and throw one on net? You never know what can happen, especially with a backup after the starter gets pulled. They don't prepare the same way they do as when they know they are the starter. I know that's their job, right? Mentally prepare so if your number gets called, you're ready. And I didn't think he played poorly, obviously. The only goal that was scored was the one in overtime by undrafted Phil Myers, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But during that moment, you need to know, as as even as a young player, okay, hold on, Grice is in net. If I'm going to try and dangle, even if it's a poor shot as I'm coming down the, the, the boards, he was coming down the left side, throw one on net. You saw how Phil Myers scored against Carey Price. Slipped right through him. And that's what happened when the Islanders made it 3-2. It slipped right underneath Carter Hart's blocker. Not a good goal for him. But how am I supposed to be pissed off after he has such a tremendous performance and makes 30 saves that he probably shouldn't have? You make 30 saves that normal goalies don't make, yet I'm going to be mad at you for the short-handed one. Not short-handed, short-sided goal. That does need to be saved, though. To be fair, it does. And if you asked him, he would say it a million times. That's why I'm okay with criticizing him. Because I know Carter Hart holds himself to a very high standard. To the point where it eats him alive that he wasn't able to make that save. Some crazy play that that happened after they made it 3-3. to Travis Sanheim behind the net. When the score is 3-2, tries to make a pass to Kutsi, who I thought probably could have supported him more. I don't know if that was a set play, a set breakout that the Flyers were trying to use in that moment, but I thought Sean Couturier could have been lower and been more of a support man for Travis Sanheim, but he throws one up the wall, goes to Pajot, who's wide open, and he beats Carter Hart over the glove. One, Sanheim... Uh, make it harder. Make it a harder pass or use the glass. Use the glass and get it out into the neutral zone. And and you can blame Kutsi, in my opinion, unless it was a set play. He's got to be lower to support. I didn't think the support was great. Use the glass. Make it harder. Do something different than what you did in that spot. Because it, I could blame Kutsi. I could blame Sanheim. But you can't make that type of mistake against the Islanders there. They cash in on mistakes. They do it time and time again. They do it. That's why they're dangerous. They suffocate you defensively, and when you make some problems, they cash in. And Pajot, wide open in the slot. Boom, just like that, it's a tied game. And all of us Flyers fans, our, our stomachs are in our guts, or our gut is in our stomach, or our heart is in our stomach, whatever the hell you want to say. You couldn't believe it. You thought, this is over. JVR passes it to Myers. He cranks one off the pipe. And then on the other end, it's like bang, bang, real quick. Barzell to Anders Lee. Pipe. Barzell's flying around the offensive zone. I get giddy watching guys do that. Because I think to myself, what the hell, bros? Why couldn't you do that? Well, that's because I was a stay-at-home defenseman who blocked some shots. I was not as physical as Robert Haig, but if you wanted a comparison of what Broads was like during his junior career, it's like a Robert Haig without the physicality part. Blocking shots, using the glass, being simple. I watch these guys, Barzell, running around the zone. I'm thinking, damn it, Broads. What the hell's wrong with your skill set? But back and forth, pipe, pipe. Elaine Vigneault challenged the offsides. Was it offsides? 
you can make the argument, maybe it was, was it too close? I think it was too close. Honestly, I thought it was too close. A.V. gambled, and gambled big time. The fact that he put the team in the box after allowing the goal to tie it, that is so ballsy. A risk I would not take personally, but A.V. has been awesome all year long. Who am I to criticize him? I'm going to. <laughs> okay? Uh, who am I? I'm Hunter Brody, and I'm going to criticize him. I don't think you can go down that road. You escaped. That's not something you can live by if you continue to challenge that type of call. Now, how often does that call pop up? Not very often. So, it's not like every game there's a chance to challenge that specific moment. I just thought it was too close. They seemed really upset on the bench. Oh, whoa, whoa. And then you had some conversations on Twitter. Like, did they even look at the right play? I don't know what was going on. There was a bit of wonkiness involved. What they showed on the TV, I thought that there was not enough evidence to overturn. You see some screenshots on Twitter where it doesn't look like the skate, who, whoever it was, I forget off the top of my head, who was trying to get back on side. It doesn't look like his skate was touching the blue line yet. But the problem is, whoever it was was blocking the puck. So you couldn't see if the puck was on anyone's stick or not at the time. They could have waited until he did cross the blue line to then touch the puck and, and it would have been on side. So it was a, a tough decision to make. AV clearly seemed like he knew that it was offsides and seemed very pissed off that it wasn't along with some of the flyers. But a risk... I am not willing to take. We give pride to Dougie P all the time, being aggressive, taking chances, fourth down. This is equivalent. Right there, that was equivalent. And maybe it was wrong. Maybe the refs did get it wrong. Maybe Toronto did get it wrong. But in reality, too close for my liking. But look, if you think about it, if they felt that strongly about challenging and it goes off the board, the Flyers win the game in regulation if they kill out the rest of the time. So it was a huge goal. I mean, if you get it right, you're talking about winning the game and not having to go to overtime. So that was the risk he was willing to go for. Super ballsy. Super, super ballsy. And we go to overtime, and Phil Myers, let's bring up Clay Giroux again. That overtime goal doesn't happen without the captain. The way he worked and grinded and won his battle in the corner, used his body puck protection that allows the Flyers to operate down low in the offensive zone. You had the great scoring chance by Kutsi. Voracek gets thrown into the wall behind the net. The puck comes up high. Phil Myers with a clapper. Bang, it hits a stick. It pops up over the shoulder, goes top shelf, and the Fly guys take it home. Awesome celebration. Great win, and now the series is tied one to one. I almost ask myself this question though Is this a positive that it played out this way? If the Flyers won four, five, nothing, six, nothing, and it was a breeze, are they thinking differently for next game? It's almost as if, okay, hold on a second. You don't have you, you can't smell yourself too much, if that makes sense. You come out with a demanding win. Do you smell yourself too much for tomorrow's back to back? Now it's, hold on, fellas, we had a big lead, and we let it go. Shame on us. We were up 3 nothing. Now your mental focus is still involved. Now it's heavily involved because you know you can't do that again. But this game was big. You lose this game after being up 3 nothing, and you're down 0-2, and you have a back-to-back. -back. Now you're talking a totally different scenario. It's possible that this game saved the Flyer season. It is possible. If we look back, you can say, hold on a second. It's possible. Big win. Big effort. Claude deserves a lot of recognition. Whatever it says on the stat sheet, he deserves a lot of praise. Do you go with Brian Elliott in, in, in tomorrow's game? You saw what they did last series where the back-to-back -back happened. They went with Carter Hart. It didn't really work out. And there's a back-to-back -back in game six and seven. You could live if you're down 1-2. If they lost this game and they're down 0-2, I don't think that there's a chance in hell. You can live being down 1-2, even though it's not ideal, of course. It's not the same as being down 0-2 going into Game 3. And if they do lose Game 3 and they're 1-2, it's, it's not as insane. You get my point? Not saying I don't want them to win, but if you're down 0-2 going into Game 3, it's a lot different than being 1-1 going into Game 3 and falling that game. And who's to say, though, that Brian Elliott can't win a game? Of course he can. 
You would think at some point the Islanders are going to have to go with their backup netminder too, unless they're just going to rock and roll with their starter Varlamov the whole time. I would be okay with going with Elliott, knowing that game six and seven is a back-to-back, which is absurd. But I'm also okay with throwing Carter Hart in between the pipes for the whole damn thing. He's young. He's not 35. He's not 36. He's young. Let him have it. Have at it, kid. Let's see what you got. You're the franchise. You're the star. And star is an understatement. Jesus, what he does out there. It's incredible stuff. I never felt so confident in some of these shot attempts in my life. They're tough saves. The quickness, the speed of going post to post, the way he flashes the pads, he makes the kick saves, he gets the posts. I feel like he's not human. I feel like he's not human. But he is. And he's on the Flyers. I feel like a broken record when I talk about character hurt, but I'm okay with it because it makes me smile. It makes me happy. Huge win. Series is tied. And let's see how they respond in game three. Let's see how they respond from allowing a 3 nothing lead to become a 3-3 game going into overtime. Luckily, it didn't go into a six-overtime game like you saw with the Columbus Blue Jackets and... Was that the Maple Leaf Series? No, that wasn't the Maple Leaf Series. That was the Tampa Bay Lightning Series. Luckily, it didn't do that because with a back-to-back, that would be brutal. Quick, to the point, Phil Myers, undrafted. Awesome story. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.